to open your Bibles this morning to the book of 1 John, right to the end of your Bible, the book of 1 John, chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 11 through 13. My message is how to know you're saved. You know, I've never had in our church people come up to me and say, Pastor, I do not know if I'm saved. And I believe one of the reasons for that is because of the truncated gospel that's being proclaimed throughout the world today. People hear bits and pieces, this and that, or whatever, they don't have a clue what the scripture actually says. And the Bible tells us we're to measure everything according to the infallible word of God, amen? But people from the YouTube ministry and people from the TV ministry have written me a time and time again about this very message. So I was hoping I was going to do it all one in one message this morning, uh, but I will not. I'm going to split it up so I can take my time with it. I am, this week I was going to preach to you how to know you're saved. And next week I was going to preach to you how to know you can't, you're not saved. But I think I'll take my time because I'm going to give you ten points. And I was going to breeze through them, but I want to spend a little time on them. So I'll give you five today, five next week, Lord willing, the quick don't rise. And then uh, on the third week I will preach how to know you're not saved. Now remember, beloved, this has absolutely nothing to do with how you feel. Now, many people have said to me over the years, Pastor, I feel saved. That means nothing. That means nothing, beloved. My feelings have been wrong many times. How about yours? But the Word of God is true. That's that ancient word that the choir just sang about. So my message is how to know you're saved. How to know you're saved. 1 John chapter 5, we're going to read verses 11 through 13. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. That's what they did when Ezra read the word of the Lord. They put the pulpit in front of them. The people stood up to hear the word of the Lord. 1 John chapter 5, beginning with verse 11. John says, And this is the record that God had given uh, to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now watch what he says. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe or keep on believing on the name of the Son of God. Now John wrote this so we can know that we have eternal life. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. Father, we pray that as we study it this morning, the Holy Spirit would be present to anoint it, to grant us the understanding as the indwelling, blessed illuminator, the resident teacher. And Lord, you'd open up to us the scriptures. And Lord, if we find that we're not saved, that we just uh, throw ourselves on your mercy, throw ourselves on your grace, and we do what the scriptures say, and we'd get saved. Father, I pray for the rest of us who would give us the confidence that we know that we're under a child of God. I pray that you'd anoint this preacher with feet of clay. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen, and you may be seated. Beloved, one of the great promises of God is to definitely know that you are saved. I mean to definitely know that you have the assurance of your salvation. To definitely know that you're, you're confident that you're a Christian. You've someone who's been heaven born, heaven blessed, and heaven bound. Would you say amen out there? Now remember, this has nothing to do with how you feel. This has to do, as we're going to see what the scripture says. When someone asks you, are you saved, you should be able to respond, hallelujah, praise the Lord, glory to God, I know that I'm saved. I know that I'm saved because of what the Word of God has to say. Would you say amen out there? You see, God wants us to have the blessed assurance, that blessed confidence, that certainty, if you will, that you're saved so that you can live a victorious Christian life in peace and in joy. Remember, Jesus gives us his peace. There's not much peace out here in the world. So if you're saved, you should have the peace of God that passeth all understanding. Would you say amen? So, beloved, if you're saved, you ought to absolutely know it. And if you're not saved, then you also need to know it. Why? You can get saved. Amen? So God doesn't want us to be doubting Christians regarding our salvation. When someone asks if we're saved, God wants us to be able to say a resounding, I know so, and not an uncertain, I hope so. So many people, I've said to them, are you saved? Do you know the Lord? Do you truly know the Lord? Well, I hope so. Well, beloved, I have never, since the day that I got saved, ever doubted my salvation. 
and you'll see why, and I'm probably you have the same feeling or the same attitude because you've studied the Word of God. Anyways, beloved, there's nothing worse, nothing worse than living a miserable, uh, in miserable uncertainty and insecurity when it comes to your salvation because that is the surest way for a person to be despondent, discouraged, and live a defeated Christian life. It's the surest way if you're always living in doubt. You see, God wants us to feel safe. God wants us to feel secure. Like when my kids were growing up, I want them to feel safe. I want them to feel secure. I remember coming home one night. I was out on visitation. It was probably 10, 1030. And I came upstairs. I was going to my bedroom. And Kobe's bedroom was on the left. Nick was on the right. And I was walking in. And Kobe was still up. And he said, Dad, I'm so glad that you're home. I feel safe. The father in the home makes the home feel safe. Amen? And so God wants us to be at home in him. And he wants us to feel safe and secure in our salvation. Would you say amen? He doesn't want us to feel insecure in it or, uh, or uh, unsafe in it, beloved. But the Bible, now listen to me, the Bible does not teach, once saved, always safe, that some unfortunately and erroneously believe and teach today, beloved, but it does teach we are eternally secure in Christ, <coughs> excuse me, if we place and keep our faith in him throughout our life. In other words, Scripture teaches that God keeps those who keep their faith and their love in Jesus Christ. For example, 1 Peter 1.5 says this, For we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now watch me now. We are kept by the power of God, that's divine sovereignty. Through faith, human responsibility, working in conjunction with God's divine sovereignty. God's divine sovereignty provides everything we need for life and godliness, but faith must reach out and appropriate that in their life. Come on and say amen out there. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this, that God preserves those who persevere in the faith. Then we'll ultimately be eternally secure when we are finally secure in eternity. So I exhort you to keep your faith, to keep your love in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, biblically speaking, <clears throat> God wants us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Now listen, beloved, I'm going to repeat this many times, that you are truly saved. Now remember, truly saved does not mean I feel saved. I've gone to this church, I've gone to that church, I've prayed over here, whatever. i prayed every day of my life till I was 24 years of age, and I was still lost. And I always believed in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I prayed to Jesus every day. But it was when I was 24 years of age, that I finally got saved. Probably was a real rascal and God had to shake the fire out of me, right? But he wants, to, wants us to know, beloved, that we're a true child of God, that we are indeed a member of the family of God, that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, and that we are on our way to live with him in the eternal kingdom of God. Amen? So, beloved, now listen carefully. <clears throat> John's gospel was written to show us how to be saved. When you read John's gospel, read that, how to be saved. John chapter 3, except a man is born again, he what? He cannot see, he cannot enter in to the kingdom of God. Except a man is born, this is what he says, of the water and of the spirit, he says, he cannot see, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Therefore, Jesus said, ye must be born again. Notice how emphatic, how dogmatic he was. So, beloved... John's gospel was written to show us how to be saved, whereas 1 John, this epistle right here, beloved, was written to tell us how we can know for sure that we are saved. Because there are earmarks, there are benchmarks that God shows us so we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt, have that confidence, have that certainty that we indeed are a child of God. We're glory bound, amen? Now, beloved, just one word of caution here. Scripture nowhere gives the impenitent backslider or the apostate living in sin the assurance of their salvation. None. He gives them none whatsoever, beloved. Only those Christians. But only those Christians who are living for God and who are persevering in the faith can have that kind of confidence and that kind of assurance. Now that's important that we understand that because that is a principle that is taught everywhere throughout the Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament. Would you say amen? So, beloved, those who are 
are given the assurance of their salvation. Because God, God wants his faithful servants to have the confidence, to have the certainty of their salvation. So I want to give you ten principles or benchmarks in God's word that teach you how to know that you're saved for sure. And as we briefly discuss them, beloved, I want you to apply them to yourself and see how you meet and measure up to the biblical criteria. Not your personal criteria, not your religious criteria, but to the biblical criteria. Now, I told you from the outset, um, I'm going to give you only five of them today. Lord willing and the creek don't rise, I'll give you the next five next week if I'm still above ground or pushing up daisies. <laughs> and then the following week, we will t uh, I will teach from the Bible how to know you're not saved. That's as important, by the way, of knowing how you are saved. Amen? Now, the first thing I want you to see in the Word of God is the spiritual conversion. If you're taking notes, the spiritual conversion. I want you to look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 1a, and then we're going to drop down to verse number 4. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1a, and then we'll drop down to verse 4. And beginning with verse number 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, he's the Mashiach, he's the Messiah, is born of God. Drop down to verse 4. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now, here we see, beloved, that a person can know for sure whether or not they are born again, whether they are born of God. Now, there's four words that I want you to see in verse number one. The first word is believeth. Believeth. It is the Greek word pistuo. Pistuo. And it's a perfect present tense verb that means to initially believe and to constantly and continuously keep on believing the gospel truth. What gospel truth? That Jesus is indeed God's son. That Jesus is indeed the Christ. He's the Messiah. That Jesus indeed is the Lord and Savior of the world. Now I want you to notice something here, beloved. Because so many Christians make this, with a D, this word believeth with a D. Notice, beloved, it doesn't say he that believed. That is a past tense verb, as if it were just a one-time act of faith that secured your soul for all eternity. But rather, it says he that believeth, which is a perfect present tense verb. That means to have believed and keep on believing this truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. It means that he has believed and he's constantly and continuously during the course of his life believing in this blessed truth. Would you say amen? And beloved, it means that you keep on keeping on believing it. And only those who do this can know for sure that they indeed have true saving faith as long as they have done exactly what the Word of God has told them to do. Now that's important we understand that. You see, beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ, our blessed Savior, wants us to have this blessed assurance of our salvation. Why? Because, beloved, <clears throat> excuse me, without true saving faith, you'll never be saved. We can have faith in a lot of things that are not true. Amen? I've done that myself. I've placed my faith or trust in someone or something, and it's been totally uh, wrong. Uh, I should have never have done that. It's, the end result was nothing that I expected. Now listen to me before I go any further. You want to make sure every Christian has a humble, reachable, and teachable spirit. Amen? You need to say, Lord, I need to be able to receive this. I want to hear what the Spirit has to say under the churches. I want to hear with my own ears what the Word of God has to say. I want to hear the Spirit of God speaking to me. So, beloved... Why does he want us to have the assurance of our salvation? Because people like this know and have experienced that this saving faith that they had led them to true spiritual conversion. In other words, they saw that they were, went from being an unsaved heathen to now being a true born-again, Bible-believing, sin-hating, devil-stopping, pulpit-pounding, window-rattling, shingle-pulling, blood-bought, born-again, Judeo-Sabbath-keeping Christian. Come on and say that out there. Woo! <laughs> okay, they want to know that. Now listen to me, beloved. That's the first word. I told you there was four words that I want you to see. That was the first word, and that word was believeth. The next three words, genao ektheos. That's the phrase. It means born of God. Genao ektheos. 
That's the second thing, beloved, that God, by the supernatural power of his Holy Spirit, has forgiven them of all of their sins through the sinless, shameless, guiltless, blameless, crimson blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and has supernaturally regenerated their souls and radically changed them from the inside out. Would you say amen? Instinctively, beloved, they now know that something supernatural, that something spiritual, that something divine has happened inside of them when they heard and believed and obeyed the gospel, when they repented and confessed their sins to God, when they trusted and confessed Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now listen to me. And when they were baptized into Christ, hear me now, for the remission of sins and received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Would you say amen? Now, beloved, they instinctively know that they are born again. Now they instinctively know, beloved, that they've experienced the new birth. Now they instinctively know that they are indeed a true child of God. That comes from the work of God, the Holy Spirit, from the inside out. Would you say amen? Now I want you to look at verse 8. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 8. John says, And there are three that bear witness in earth. The Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, and the water, that's the water of baptism, and the blood, that's the blood of Jesus, but, but beloved, these three agree on one. In other words, they're tokens of the sacraments of baptism and communion. So, what is he saying to us here? <clears throat> Excuse me. The water here bears witness to our salvation. In other words, the waters of the ordinance or the sacrament of baptism. Those who have repented and believed the gospel and have gotten baptized in the name of the triune God as a penitent believer. That is, they've been baptized as a penitent believer into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, <coughs> excuse me, and keep on believing and following Jesus, know for sure that they are saved. Why? Because they know that the scripture says in Mark 16, 16, now listen to me now, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not this that I just said shall be damned. So I can trust, Jesus says, he that believeth and got baptized, I can say, yeah, I did that, and guess what? I know, I know for sure that I'm saved. Would you say amen? Because they can know for sure, beloved, that in Acts 2.38, the apostle Peter said to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for this promise is unto you and to your children and to those who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. It was true then, it is true now. Come on and say amen. It's for you and your children and them that are far off. Of course, he was speaking of the Gentiles. You and your children were the Jews, and then ultimately, because they were the covenant people at that time, we were engrafted into it. Then he's speaking about, of course, the Gentiles, us who were far off. And so, beloved, what am I saying to you? Uh, anyone who's done this knows for sure, God makes sure they know for sure that they're saved. Also, beloved, they can know that the scripture says in 1 Peter 3.21, now listen to what Peter says. He says that baptism doth now also save us. Now, a lot of people take umbrage with that. Now, listen to what I'm saying to you, beloved. He doesn't mean baptism alone saved you. That's not what he's talking about. You have to read the context. It's not baptism alone, but as the culminating and confirming act of our preceding faith and repentance. Amen? In other words, if I get baptized and I don't believe and I haven't repented, I'll go into the water a, a, a dry sinner and I'll come out a wet one. Nothing will happen. But if it's preceded by faith and repentance, then God will bless what happens and something supernatural will take place and the Spirit of God will come upon you and come in you. Come on and say amen out there. Now, beloved, listen to me. Those truly converted know that they're truly saved. How? Because they can look back on their baptism as the reference point in their life. They can look back on their baptism as the line of demarcation from being lost to being saved and that they were translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and of God's dear son, that is, into the kingdom of God. Would you say amen? The spiritual kingdom of God, of grace that's on this earth, and ultimately when Jesus comes again, that eternal kingdom of God in a new heaven and a new earth. Amen? So, beloved, that's why I told you our people usually don't I have to worry about that because they've been taught according to the scripture. See, beloved, I'm saying folks like this know that baptism is the place and point 
where Paul says in Romans chapter 6, where we bury the old man and put on the new man. Now, I'm not saved before them because I would be burying the new man instead of burying the old man. Amen? So we need to understand what God has to say and not what man has to say. Come on and say amen. And they know that baptism plays some point where they are outwardly washed uh, clean from the stains of sin in their bodies. You can find it in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. We get baptized to wash the stain of sin outwardly on our bodies. But also inwardly in our soul, in our spirit, beloved, we're washed clean of our sins through the sinless, shameless, guiltless, blameless, crimson blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And they can know that baptism is the place and point where they died, where they buried, where they were resurrected with Christ to walk in newness of life. In other words, they're reenacting the cross in their life, the tragedy and the triumph of the cross in their life. Now, these are the things that Scripture teaches, remember. And also, beloved, they know that baptism is the place and point. Listen to me. Now, hear me, hear me now. You folks watching on YouTube and you on TV, Baptism is the place and point with a divine name, the imprimatur of the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is stamped on their soul. There is nothing else in all of Scripture that puts the name of the triune God on your soul and on your spirit but baptism in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen? How important is that? To have God stamped imprimatur on my heart, stamped imprimatur on my soul. How important is that? I tell you, it's very important. Especially if you want the assurance of your salvation. Would you say amen? So, beloved, it assures them of their salvation and eternal life. It assures them that they belong to God. It assures them that they've, uh, they'll be, uh, or they've been, or will be resurrected and receive a new, glorified, immortal body someday the Bible says, just like Jesus Christ's glorious body. Now listen to me. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 20, the Apostle Paul is speaking to the church of Philippi. He says this. He says, for our conversation, our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the work and whereby he's even able to subdue all things unto himself. Oh, I'm waiting for the resurrection. How about you? I'm waiting for a brand new body. I can't wait to see the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't wait to be glorified. I can't wait to eat all I want, all of Ellie's yummy chocolate cake and not gain a pound. <laughs> That's the heavenly man, all right? The angel food. <laughs> Can't wait for that. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I said we can know that we're saved by looking back in faith uh, on our baptism and all that it morally and spiritually entails and represents as a divine sign and seal of our faith and salvation, and it assures us that we are truly converted. Amen? That's one of the reasons when we baptize people, we give them a, 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 a baptismal certificate so they can put it on their wall. So when the devil comes and rags on them, they say, yeah, you're not saved. You're nothing. Look how filthy and stinking you are. You can look at that and say, I know. I know that Jesus did something. I know it. I know that my God, my Lord did something. So the first thing, beloved, is the spiritual conversion, number two. The scriptural confirmation. The scriptural confirmation. Look at 1 John chapter 5, and we're going to read verse 13. John says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, you ought to circle this, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, beloved, the word know here is the Greek word ido. And it means to know by personal experience that you're saved, to have the absolute assurance of your salvation. Why? Because it says so in God's Word. And that should be enough. Amen? If the Bible said it, I believe it, that settles it. It should be. If the Bible said it, it settles it, I believe it. That's the way we should say it. Yet according to this text, beloved, I want you to look at your text again. He says, these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, beloved... He wrote that because it implies that it's possible to be saved and doubt, or he would have never said this before. Some people are truly saved, but they're always doubting 
that they're saved. Now, doubt is to your spirit what pain is to your body. In other words, beloved, pain is the body's warning signal that something inside you is wrong. Something needs healing. Something needs fixing, but you're not yet dead. When I was in the Marine Corps, <laughs> the drone stuck there walking around, pain is good. It lets you know that you're alive. <laughs> and all of us are thinking, yeah, but Billy. <laughs> they were brutal uh, in them days. But what am I saying to you, beloved? I'm saying this. Doubt in your soul, so in the soul of a true born-again Christian, reveals your suffering from some spiritual malady in your faith that needs fixing. In other words, you may have faith commingled together with some fear. You may have faith mixed together with some worry or anxiety. You may have faith mixed together with disbelief and doubt in the promises of God's word about his salvation, beloved. And remember, doubt is the enemy of faith because it makes you unsure and insecure in your faith. There's nothing worse than doubting. All of us, no matter what it is in life, We'd like to have the confidence that what we're doing is right. Amen? We have peace of mind when we do that. Now, beloved, yet some people occasionally have doubt because the devil relentlessly attacks them in the spiritual battle, and he tries to inundate your mind with this miserable and ineffective witness uh, 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 that you're not really saved because he wants you to be a miserable, ineffective witness and soldier for Christ in the battle. He doesn't want you to be victorious in the kingdom of darkness. You see, he wants this evil world system. He's the God of this evil world system. He is the prince of the power of the air. Amen? Now, you listen to me, beloved. A lot of people doubt because of their own insecurities. They, they were brought up uh, perhaps wrong. Maybe they didn't have the right uh, you know, parents that reassured them of different things. And so I can understand that. But you need to understand that the moment you get saved, you have entered into a spiritual battle whether you know it or not. And daily, in the spirit, these evil spirits are attacking us, even though people think out of sight, out of mind. And they're doing everything they possibly can to make you doubt what you did. Doubt your faith. Doubt your salvation. Doubt who Jesus is. Yet, beloved, all doubt can be remedied and reversed by remembering that salvation is an eternal and supernatural work of God, not of us, and is revealed right here in this blessed book. Amen. As God reveals it right here in his word. So you can know you're saved by trusting in the promises of God that you are, that he gives to you in your word to assure you that you are saved. Promises like what, Pastor Joel? A lot of people read their Bible and they say, well, yeah, you know, I've got a mind full of this intellectual, theological information. That has nothing to do. But if you don't have a relationship, you can be dumb as a post and have a great relationship with the Lord. And you can be a brainiac and not have any relationship with the Lord, but all your doctrinal ducks are all lined up. Promises like what, Pastor Joel? Promises like what it says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in him. That's a promise. Do you believe that? Amen, beloved. Promises like what, Pastor Joel? In Romans 10, 3, Paul said this. He says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, notice the word call there. He didn't say he that called upon the name of the Lord, past tense. He that calls and keeps on calling and keeps on calling on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you believe that? Say amen. 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 Say amen. <laughs> Hey, I remember one time in the prison ministry, right, there was these cells in, at um, Bridgewater State Prison. It used to be an old uh, fort in the, during the Civil War, and there was a heating duct that went from one cell to another, and one of my, my uh, um, students, I guess, uh, in, in, the, in the prison, uh, I had such a great relationship with him, right, but he used to love to sing, and he was a black man. He'd see, come into the chapel, amen, hallelujah. So one day I'm walking down this, uh, you have to see all the cells are over here, and then there's a little alleyway where you're walking by, you can see everybody, and I see him in his cell up next to the vent. 
Amen. And the guy on the other side saying, Hallelujah. <laughs> and in typical response, they're singing back and forth to one another. <laughs> so I joined in. Let me hear you talking now. <laughs> oh, we had, we had a lot of fun then. But beloved, what I'm saying is believing in uh, promises like John 3.16. For God so, that adverb so, you can put nine zeros on it. So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth, not believed, whosoever believeth and keeps on believing in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Come on and say amen. Promises like Mark 16, 16, when Jesus said this, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now remember that and is a coordinating conjunction connecting two words of equal worth of importance. He did not say he is saved that believed and then gets baptized. He did not say he is saved that believed, I mean got baptized and believed, like you're an infant or something. He says he that believeth and then is a penitent believer and gets baptized. Listen to me now. The unbeliever needs to believe. The believer needs to repent. And the penitent believer needs to be baptized according to the word of the Lord. Come on and say amen out there. And beloved, it promises like John 6, 37. Jesus said this, He that cometh to me, notice the word cometh. Is that past tense or present tense? Present tense. He that cometh to me, he says, I shall in no wise cast out. So if you're coming and keep coming, you say, but the pastor, I'm not prepared. But you're coming and you're coming. I want to know, is Jesus going to cast you out? Yes or no? No, he's not. No, he's not. So beloved, we need to believe these promises. And if you truly believe these promises that the scripture confirms, then you can know for sure that you are saved. Indeed, the whole chapter of 1 John chapter 5 is written to confirm this. Read the chapter when you go home today. No, so, number three, beloved, the supernatural conformation. I didn't say confirm. You know what I said? Confirmation. The supernatural confirmation. I want you to look at First John chapter five and verse eighteen. John says, "We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not." Now, beloved, that does not mean he never commits a sin. The Greek tense here is he does not habitually practice sin anymore. Because none of us are going to be perfect until the day we grace the doors of God's heaven. Amen? But whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God, now watch what he says, keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Now, beloved, some five times here. Excuse me. Let me back up. When you trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you got baptized, you knew that something inside you now radically changed, that you were indeed born of God. I didn't say something that came on you. I said something that came in you. Would you say amen? In other words, beloved, you knew you were different morally. You knew that you were different spiritually. You knew that you were different personally and behaviorally. Try to say that. Behaviorally. Okay, say it. You're doing better than I do. Come, fin come finish the message. <laughs> you see, beloved, somehow, when this happened, the sinful things of this world now lost their appeal to you. The holy, righteous things of th of, uh, that you used to hate, now you loved, and the evil things that you wanted to do, that you used to do, now you hated doing it because you knew it was not right and it was not pleasing to your God and you wanted to please your God. Amen? I mean, I remember when I got saved, I told you I was a musician, I played the drums, I had a band, and I, I, I got saved and I walked out into my truck, turned the radio on, and then days, uh, W, uh, what was it, WATD was starting to play all this rock music, whatever, and I got into the truck, and I, I didn't know anything about anything, okay? I'd just been reading the Bible. Didn't know any, nobody talked to me about whatever. And I had to turn to the WPLM that played the big band music. <laughs> Pennsylvania 6, 5, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I want to sing the rest of the other. Because they dollar. But there was something that would, was upsetting my spirit, and I knew, I knew then, this had to be nothing but God Almighty. Would you say amen out there? 
You see, beloved, when this happens, when you have this spiritual confirmation of being begotten of God, born of God, when you have that, now you hate sin. Now you want to quit the sin business. Now you want to separate from sin and sinners in this evil world system. Now you want to live a holy and a righteous and a godly life that's pleasing to God. Would you say amen? Now you want to strive to be conformed and transformed into the very image and likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you think differently. Now you speak differently. Now you act differently. Now you react differently. Why? Because something inside of you has changed. Now you talk differently. Amen? And now you know you, the Holy Spirit made sure that you stumbled across. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says this, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Come on and shout, hallelujah. All righty, a bunch of Pentecostals, I'll get you to shake the fire out of you. You see, beloved, what I'm saying to you, I'm saying you know that you're a new person now. You know you're a new man, you're a new woman, a new Christian, beloved. The supernatural confirmation of you by God into the image and likeness of Christ tells you that you know that you're saved and you know that God is now working to mold and shape your life. You just are not that same person you used to be. I've been in enough physical confrontations in my life. My, my father-in-law, God bless his soul, I'll never forget it. Some person one time in my health food store, they came walking in and they started dressing me down. And immediately my body flushed and it was like a drum skin. You could have, it was taunt as a drum skin. And I said, okay, I heard what you have to say. Thank you, you can get out of here. My father looked at me and said, boy, you changed. And I said, you're right, I have changed. I says, I am a true Christian now. Before, I had a, he'd have gone right out the door, he came in. <laughs> okay. But the Lord restrained me. The Lord didn't want me to do that anymore. <clears throat> Excuse me. I said, so what am I saying to you? I'm saying you've had a supernatural confirmation. You've had a spiritual conversion. Beloved, God is working powerfully in your life, and you know it. Number four, I want to get these in. I've got a few minutes left. The Spirit's confirmation. The Holy Spirit's confirmation. I want you to look at 1 John verse 9, and we're going to look at verse 10a. 1 John chapter 5, verse 9, and then we're going to read right through to verse 10a. He says, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness of in himself. Now, beloved, some five times here, John uses the word witness, and he does it for a reason. The Holy Spirit has had him write this. The word witness, materia, we get our English word mata from it, to witness through blood. And it means to testify, it means to prove, it means to affirm and confirm. It means the, the divine witness whereof Jesus speaks here, or John speaks here, beloved, that's indwelling in the believer, of course, refers to the indwelling Holy Spirit. And one of the primary ministries of the Holy Spirit to the Christian is to supernaturally bear witness, to testify, to affirm and confirm, and to prove to our heart and prove to our mind and soul and spirit, ladies and gentlemen, that we are indeed accepted in the beloved. We are indwelt by the living God, and we now belong to him in spite of all our imperfections. Amen. Listen to me, when you come to Christ, you come to Christ with all kinds of baggage. Now, the day you got saved, you weren't made perfect on this earth. You were in heaven, for Christ's sake. That's justification. God declared you righteous. But well, sanctification is a <clears throat> process. And sometimes God has to take us out to the woodshed to get us to bow the knee, amen, because we can be so full of ourselves, so prideful that we don't want to humble ourselves in the sight of God. But remember, Jesus said it's the meek who shall inherit the earth. Not the weak. Meekness is tough and tender strength. It's not weakness. That's what meekness is, tough and tender strength. A real tough guy is meek. Why? Because he knows he can clean the floor of this person, but he's not going to do it just to show off. He's tough and he's tender. Amen? That's what God wants from us. Now, 
The indwelling Holy Spirit verifies the very depths of our innermost being that we are now indeed a child of God. Praise the Lord. That we are now a saint. We are now a servant and a steward of God. That we are now the temple of the living God, beloved. And God now dwells on us individually as a Christian and corporately in the local and in the universal church spread out throughout the world. Would you say amen out there, regardless of the denomination, by the way, if they're truly born again. Now, I want you to look back up. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 and verse 13. He says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, who is he speaking about? Christ, okay. But how does Christ drive? drive? Okay. That's all right, brother. We won't take you out to the woodshed. Drop down to verse 13. This answers your question, David. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his what? Spirit. He has given us of his spirit. So, beloved, what am I saying to you here? I'm saying this. He says, greater is he. That word greater is he. Megas esti means specifically, it refers to the living Christ who's in us via the Holy Spirit in us, who now gives us a more stronger confirmation, a more mighty confirmation, a more powerful confirmation and witness of the truth that we are indeed saved and that we belong to God, that we are his prized possession, we are his property, and we are his uh, peculiar people. And beloved, contextually, this is contrary to the spirit of Antichrist, to the spirit of Satan, to the spirit of this world that's telling you you don't know the truth and that you are not saved. But we know we belong to God. Amen. We know the truth. And the, the spirit is the spirit of truth and he's not the spirit of error. Come on and say amen out there. When people say to me this and that and the other thing I say, and if I've never heard it before, I say, oh, it's, oh, when I, okay, prove it to me from the scripture. I, 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 if you're right, hallelujah, you've done the work for me. I don't, have to, I don't have to do all the, spend all the time researching. But if you're wrong, you need to bow the knee then. You need to bring your convictions in alignment with what the Scripture says. What do you think? You see, beloved, so how do you know you're saved? The Holy Spirit confirms it in you. How do you know you're saved? The Holy Spirit verifies it in you. He authenticates it in you. Would you say amen? And number five, and I'll close with this. The scriptural craving. The scriptural craving. In other words, beloved, we've seen the spiritual conversion. We've seen the scriptural confirmation. We've seen the supernatural confirmation. We've seen the Spirit's confirmation. And look at the spiritual craving. Look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 9. John says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, his sperma, his spiritual DNA remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. That is, habitually practice sin anymore, because he is born of God. Now, beloved, that word seed, I told you, is the Greek word sperma. In the parable of the sower, Jesus said this, that the seed is the word of God, sown and implanted in the heart of those who will receive it. Amen? Some think that this seed just refers to the Holy Spirit. Well, it certainly does refer to him, too. But it's more than that, beloved. It refers to the supernatural regenerating power of the Holy Spirit that works principally through the Word of God and the Gospel and planting the seed of God in the Gospel in our heart so we can be saved. Listen to me. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Paul says this, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ, for it is the power, it is the dunamis of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Would you say amen? So if I want to be born again, I need to hear the gospel. I need to have that seed implanted inside of my heart. Amen. I need to have the Holy Spirit supernaturally regenerate that seed so it will grow. So I can grow in grace and in the knowledge of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and not grown in disgrace of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, beloved, I want you to notice also in verse 9, the word remaineth. That's an interesting word. Sometimes we just blow right over it. That word remaineth is the Greek word meno. And 
That is, it constantly and continuously, the seed abides and endures and stays and dwells in us and prevents us from habitually sinning like before we got saved. Why? Because now we have been supernaturally enlightened and illuminated by the Holy Spirit through the gospel, through the seed of the word of God. Amen? Now we know right from wrong. Now we know left from right. Now we hear the Spirit saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Turn not to the left, turn not to the right, as Isaiah said. This is the way, walk ye in it. So, beloved, this denotes and implies that those who are truly saved, if that seed remains in me, it denotes that they hunger, that they thirst, that they desire, that they have an appetite to now read the Bible, to study and know the Bible, to obey the Bible, to meditate on God's word, will, and ways. Why, beloved? So they devour the scriptures because now they love the Bible. Would you say amen? The day I got saved, beloved, I could not put this Bible. There's never been one day of my life, not one, not one, that I've not read and studied the Bible. When I came out of surgery uh, three years ago, I was in the ICU. Yeah, the ICU. First thing I said is, where's my Bible? And uh, this doctor was an Indian doctor. I think his name was Saripa Rapper, something like that. But I remembered his name, but he forgot mine. And he came in, and he said, well, how are you doing? I says, how am I doing who? And he looks at me, he says, well, I said, he grabbed my chart. I said, you don't even know my name, but I know yours. And he says, hmm, what's that? No, my Bible's this thick. I got, I'm a Pharisee. See, it weighs 25 pounds. <laughs> he said, what's that? I said, what does it look like? He said, well, it looks like a Bible. I said, you ever read it? He says, no. I said, you need to. He says, why? He says, I, I, I operated on it. I said, it was the great physician, him himself, who gave you the skills to do what you did on me. I said, by the way, were there any canaries in me when you opened me up? He said, yeah, two. You see, beloved, we love the Bible now. Why is that, Pastor? So we can better know God and love God and worship God and obey God and serve God. Why is that, Pastor? So we can glorify and praise and honor the mighty and majestic God who gave us this great salvation, beloved, who gave us the word of God. Would you say amen? Who gave us this so great salvation, this pearl of great price. You can't buy it anywhere. You can't earn it anywhere. You can't work for it anywhere. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Come on and say amen out there. See, beloved, so great salvation. Not just a great salvation, it's so. Put nine zeros on that, too. And so many people trifle with the Word of God, and they trifle with their salvation. And they think, you know what, I can do all this and still grace the doors of God's heaven. Remember, I'm telling you how you can know that you're saved according to the will of God and the Word of God. Would you say amen? And so, beloved, people like this who love the Word of God, they do what 1 Peter 2.2 says. As newborn babes, they desire the sincere milk of the word. Why? That they may grow thereby. That they can mature in the faith. They can be an adult Christian. So they can know this great God of the universe. In a more intimate and relational and personal level, would you say amen? So they can grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's 2 Peter 3.18. And beloved, so now like King David in Psalm 119.7, we also can say this, because we love the Word of God, we love to read the Word of God. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day long. Would you say, I put the word long in there because the Hebrew requires it. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day long. Jesus saw Nathaniel under the tree meditating on the Word of God. David at night as a young shepherd boy would look up into the nocturnal heavens and he'd meditate, the Bible says, on the Word of God. Do you meditate on the Word of God? If you do, beloved, that's a good sign you're saved. Amen? Unsaved people don't like to meditate on the Word of God. And if they do, they don't like to obey it because that's what it takes for us to be saved. Amen? So what what am I saying to you? I'm saying you can know for sure that you're saved if you genuinely now love the Holy Scriptures and you crave and you yearn and you burn to learn them, beloved, now the inherent, supernatural, inspired Word of God is unlocked, unloaded, 
and unleashed in your life. That's why you're changing. See, that seed is blossoming. Would you say it's going from an embryo into a, a beautiful flower? Of course, mo most of you like roses. You've got thorns all over you, but it's a beautiful flower anyways. Amen. So, beloved, whew, just finished. So that's it. That's my message for today. Lord willing, next week I'll give you the next five principles. How you can know for sure? Well, it says here the scriptural craving. We saw the spirit's confirmation. We saw the supernatural confirmation. We saw the scriptural confirmation. We saw the spiritual conversion. That's how you can know biblically that you are a true child of God. If you believe that, say amen. All righty, let's go to the Father.